Well, Troy, welcome. Uh, thank you for what you do, by the way. And I, I'd be remiss to, to, to not point out that you're doing some wonderful work in the uh, nutrition, obesity, healthcare space. I mean, you kind of, like me, you found that the, the traditional medicine is letting let many people down. The traditional dietary advice has let many people down, including yourself. You lived that for most of your life and uh, you know found out that um, a lot of the advice that people tell you just doesn't work, you know? <laughs> So, so anyway, let's, you know, let, I, I know we've talked, I've talked to you several times and I think some of the people know, but you know, if you guys don't know, Tro is a, uh, I guess, obesity medicine specialist now coming from internal medicine, has a online and, and I think, well, Thomas, tell us a little bit your practice, Joe. I think that's, that's a very interesting aspect that you get going on. You're growing nationally, you, you're, you're, you're licensed in most states now, if I'm not mistaken, but tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, um, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's great to be back here. Uh, you know, what we saw right away was, you know, I'm licensed in New York. I'm an obesity medicine doctor. Um, how did I get there? I was 350 pounds and I went to the literature, you know, uh, just like you did, Sean. And, and, and I said to myself, when my wife challenged me to like, hey, figure this out, you know, I, I went back to the literature, like the primary literature. I was like, I'm going to treat this like pneumonia. Right, I'm gonna go see what the head-to-head -head studies are, look to see what did better. I'm gonna start with an evidence-based approach. That was seven years ago, you know, um, when she really challenged me. And then I spent that whole year basically reading as much as I could, um, and you know, basically delving deeper and deeper into the literature, deeper and deeper into low carb, questioning things. Um, you were, you were, you know, very much a part of that. I was like very, you know, a proponent of low carb and I'm like, oh, you got to have some carbs, you know, uh, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with plants. And then you challenged me, this was like six years ago to go, you know, full carnivore. And I remember that, you know, uh, very well, you know, I was like, you know what, let me, this crazy guy, man, I'll just do what he says. It was like for one month, you know, I went carnivore and, uh, this is, this is probably like five years ago. Um, and you know, anyway, throughout this whole process, I lost 150 pounds and, you know, at the same time, like seven years ago, six years ago, you know, I'm seeing the, basically the evils of the modern medical complex, right? I'm in this big, huge hospital practice. And they're telling me, you know, you can't send your patients here. We want you to send them here. You can't refer to this gastroenterologist. We want you to send them to this gastroenterologist. And uh, so quickly, as these nutritional dogmas are, are being, dis I'm discovering them, I see the problems of modern medicine. So I'm like, I got to get the fuck out of here. Excuse my language. I'm a New Yorker. So just apologize to everybody. Um, and uh, so that's when this all started. And so five years ago, you know, I left, there were six years ago, I left that practice and I had a restrictive covenant, which is, and you guys may not know this, but in the practice of medicine, the big hospitals say, you know, if you leave us, you can't practice in the area for two years. Well, one of the exceptions I had, because I've always been inspired by lifestyle medicine and, you know, was doing a, uh, uh, um, you know, anything related to weight loss, lifestyle uh, was carved out of that. And they can't, they couldn't stop me from doing telemedicine. So, f you know, five years ago, I'm like, okay, great. This is what I got. I hate the system. I know the nutritional system is BS and I want to practice good medicine. So I started doing online medicine and, um, now, I mean, let's fast forward, right? We have 40, you know, more than 30 people in our practice, in this practice, who have lost 100 pounds and kept it off. We have like a total of over 30,000 pounds lost. I can't count how many people we've gotten off insulin. Um, and we are a completely integrated telehealth practice at this moment. We have finished integrating. We have, we can monitor ketones remotely, breath ketones remotely, continuous blood sugar remotely, sleep apnea remotely, hypertension remotely, arrhythmias remotely, body weight, body composition, body water remotely, temperature, pulse oximetry, all remotely. 
So we are a completely remote, fully integrated telehealth practice. And the sad part is, you know, over the last couple of years, when I've dealt with these companies, you know, we are literally the first one. This is the saddest part, Sean. I, you know, when I went to up the chain at Abbott and, and Dexcom, and I said, I want primary integration into the, the data, they're like, you, you don't want to do that. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, nobody else has asked for it. This is literally the head of, you know, informatics at Abbott. Nobody else has asked for it. And if you want to do that, it's going to cost 10,000 a year. That's, that's what they said. We haven't even done it with Kaiser yet. We haven't even done it. Like we're, we're still figuring it out, you know? And so we've literally pushed the envelope with every, all these device manufacturers to, to work together. And uh, we're the first practice to integrate with Keto Mojo. We're one of the first practices to integrate with Biosense, the breath meters. You know, we're fully integrated with Abbott and Dexcom. We have scales, blood pressure cuffs, you know, virtual sleep study, virtual ambulatory monitors, you know, virtual Holter monitors. You don't have to leave your home, we'll send it to you. Right, so um, this, and why, why have I done this? It's not like, oh, it'll be cool and novelty. It's because I was a physician working 120 hours a week and I knew what it would take to, be, to, to make a lifestyle change in that moment. It had to be easy. It had to be in my home. I didn't have to get dolled up to go see the doctor. I didn't have to get dressed up, drive half an hour, wait in a waiting room for an hour to talk to somebody. It needed to be easy, seamless. And what, what we've really found over the last three years is that you can't let go. A lot of people here on your journey, I'm sure they, they see that, you know, that, uh, um, you know, weight loss is half the battle. Weight maintenance is like my focus. Like right now, if somebody's appetite is out of control and they don't know what they're doing and they're off their diet, right? Who do you, how many of you have talked to your doctors, right? Who, who calls up their doctor and says, I've gone off my diet. So at the least, our practice is like a binge eating hotline you know, text us, call us. We may not be able to get to you like at midnight or 2 a.m., but we'll contact you the next morning. We'll, it, we're not gonna let you gain 20 pounds back. We're gonna, you know, and in, in this perpetual Monday, you know, that never comes like, oh, I ate whatever, I might as well eat ice cream and potato chips and I'll start again on Monday. We just don't let that happen, right? Or at least we try not to. So we, we wanna be a part of the entire process for as long as we can and like truly just being available. Because right now, if you're binge eating or going off your lifestyle, you're not calling anybody. So we'll call you. That's been the motto here. And let me tell you, it has been hard and lonely, hard and lonely. Yeah, I mean, sure. We we have something similar. With, we you know we have this sort of instant access to coaches. You know, same thing for the same potential issues. You know, you people that are on the ledge for whatever reason. You know, they're they had a rough day at work, or you know, whatever. Their boyfriend yelled at them, or something, and, and they're having a fight, or their girlfriend broke up with them. And you know, they they, they you know as they know they they use food as a as a therapy mechanism, which is you know, and and they often use a food that's not they're not they're not you know, going out and drowning their sorrows in ribeye steak or, you know, chicken breasts or they're doing it in, you know, you know, ice cream and chocolate and all the other stuff that we all, you know, did that with. But so, you know, what about the cost? Um, because this is something, you know, uh, healthcare, you know, as you know, the healthcare industry or healthcare, uh, our health, U.S. healthcare system is about a $3.5 trillion a year and growing uh, annual you know, expenditure for not very much, you know, as far as health outcomes are concerned. I think we, I think, you know, even the most skeptical of, of physicians would, would agree that uh, um, we, we are not very cost effective. How does, how does the cost aspect of what you do compare to say what you're doing as, a, as an outpatient, what, what you might see a typical outpatient clinic look like? Yeah, so, you know, I've thought a lot about that. Um, you know, that right now, you know, we've made the Roadster, you know, let's put it in Tesla kind of format, right? We made the Roadster. 
and now we're working on making it easy, right? So we've, we've developed what it takes to, to do this on a very high level for weight loss. And then we are making like the model three as we speak. So we're very cognizant. Not everybody can afford $500 a month and all this fancy equipment, right? But you don't, not everybody needs all the equipment at the same time. Like, so if what we're trying to do is figure out when the best time to deploy certain pieces of equipment. For example, everybody comes to me for like weight loss, right? And they get a scale in the weight loss program, right? But they don't really know that we don't care at all about their weight during the program because 99% of people in our weight loss program lose weight. I don't care about it. We're just actually training them to get on the scale and get used to us monitoring it. So when they're done with the program for the next two, three years, that if things slip up, we can reach out to them, right? We don't need them to use a CGM forever. We need them to use a CGM up front so they could see the lies that people told them that eggs cause diabetes and you know, meat's gonna, you know, it's all about calories, all this nonsense, right? So, and then they don't need to take a million measurements with their Keto Mojo or Biosense, right? But we want to use it sort of as a maintenance, like when they're checking, you know, once a month or, or a couple times a year, we want to make sure, we want access to that data and make sure that they're, that they're staying where they're supposed to be. And the reality is, is most people are buying the stuff anyway. Most people got in this room, I mean, how many people have a Keto Mojo or whatever the other keto meter is? Just raise your hand, right? At least like half the people just raise their hand. So why would I want access to that data, right? So, so and here's the, the truth of it. I just had a consult yesterday and, uh, you know, the person's basically talking to me about their uh, money problems and they're spending $400 on supplements a month. Right. That's the cost of our program. So, you know, and the <laughs> here's the flip side. If we get people on insulin, you know, we're probably going to save the money. Right. So that's so I think right now we've perfected the roadster and now we're making it like a low. We're trying to make this a low monthly payment where you get coaching, community and medical care, you know, um, and I think that's key, right? And now in terms of like reimbursement, we're out of network. So if somebody has good insurance coverage, they'll get it all back. Um, and if not, you know, we're trying to make it so for a hundred bucks a month, you're getting like a premier service, you know, that's better than, I mean, it's the cost of a cable bill, let's be honest, right? So, and it's your health, right? I mean, it's, so that's, you know, we're, we're trying to do, we're trying, and then, you know, one of the things we've recently done is, you know, we started offering a certain amount of charity care. So if people can't afford us, just apply for financial hardship. We work with a not-for-profit, you know, we'll, we'll get you in, you know, so, you know, I, you're right. This is a, this is a mess. Um, we're trying to work within the system and a little bit outside of the system. Yeah, and true. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a capacity. I mean, if, if, if you're the doc, you can only see X amount of people. You've got some, you know, you've got some people around you that support you. What is that? What is it? What is a plan long term as far as I mean, is this something, you know, we've got, you know, we've got a model like something like Verta Health where they, 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 they've got more people. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of growth in this space, this digital health market space. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people out there trying to, you know, affect this because there's a lot of people to see what the problem is. And so um, are you looking to hire physicians? Are you looking to hire coaches? Are you looking to uh, expand in, in a certain way? What's what's the long-term vision there? Yeah, I, I think that a good physician should be able to manage about five to 10,000 patients, right? And the problem is the upfront time is the big issue, right? So our patients, when they get onboarded, right, they have a half an hour meeting with my medical assistant or manager, right? Just to get started. They have an hour and a half meeting with me, right? And then they have an hour follow-up thereafter, right? And then follow-ups are half an hour. So 
we're investing time up front, right? With the hopes that if somebody sees the value that they'll stay on for a long time, right? That they'll stay. So we're spending the time up front, right? In, in hopes for the long game, like, and, and it's, pay, it's played out. Once people's health is improved, why would they want to go back to the doctor or down the street who just didn't really do anything for them? So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're at the point now where we're probably looking for more coaches and more physician extenders. Um, but first, my next step is to go, we're at about 20 states right now. We need to finish basically 45 states. Once we get 45 or so states, then uh, the problem is doctors are licensed in one state, you know? So I need PAs or MPs with multi-state licenses or physicians that are multi-state licensed, right? So uh, at some point, if we, you know, if we do this right, we'll make the funnel big enough where we can start to distribute out to other physicians. And the problem is, you know, Doctors are, I mean, like if you're a low carb doc, you're vehemently independent, right? You probably, you probably invest in Bitcoin, right? Okay. You probably, you know, you probably, you, you have to be against the grain, you know, pun intended. So it's really tough working with not, you know, it's coordinating with low carb docs. It's just, it's, it's not, you know, so, so. I don't know how that'll turn out. And you know, everybody wants to be independent, right? So that's, that's also tough. And, you know, uh, so that's, that's some tough things ahead in terms of scaling, but I'm not worried about scaling. You know, I, I can get up to 10,000, when I get to 10,000 patients, you know, then, and I feel like I can't manage them well. I mean, that's a good problem to have. You know, so I'm not, I, I don't want to focus on that. I know Verda is worried about scaling. I know, you know, other telehealth companies are worried about scaling. I'm worried about getting the best people. Um, if you look at our health coaches, you know, Amy, uh, I guess she's lost 200 pounds and kept it off five years. That's who I want. Brian Wiley has lost a hundred pounds and kept it off more than a decade. Right. So, you know, I don't want to hire some doc, right? And the, the last part of this problem is, you know, I sit on the board of directors is on for the SMHP, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. We have to standardize this education, right? I mean, you and I just kind of went out there and, and we did our own due diligence, but we have to teach this medicine to our, you know, the future, the med students and the, uh, the doctors. So as we get people speaking the same language, right, doctors and PAs and NPs and dietitians, then it'll be easier to scale. Because right now I can't just hire any doc, right? And, and you know, there may be some doc who, who knows this, but how would I know if, you know, there needs to be some sort of certification process. So that's in the works. So we're, I mean, the, the idea of scaling is there, but it's, you know, it's a tough, like the business side is tough. Yeah, I, I, I definitely feel your pain on that. But anyway, let me ask you, Trill, um, just let's talk about the, the nuts and bolts and the, the practical applications. You know, you talk about, I mean, I, I know famously you and, and Lane Norton go back and forth. And, you know, it's, I know you guys have had a recent discussion. I didn't listen to it, but I, you know, I'm sure it was cordial. You know, I've been in the room, you know, I've, I've, I've had my time with him. And um, one of the things that, you know, you point out, you know, calories in, calories out, maybe that's a destination, but you don't give anybody a roadmap on how to get there, you know, and it's kind of like, well, yeah, that's fine, but uh, I can't do that as someone who's addicted to, you know, food and I can't do balance and moderation. So what, what have you discovered uh, as someone who was formerly morbidly obese and is now, you know, not that way? What, what, what has been the most beneficial uh, part of that whole journey for you? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll tell you right now, the calories in, calories out nonsense has probably been harmful. I honestly believe it's been harmful, right? It's just, it help, has helped nobody, right? They've done countless studies where they show the information on menus and it doesn't help anybody make a decision. The increased labels, you know, the changes in legislation in New York City, there was a whole big deal about adding 
you know, calories to the, to the menus at, in New York City, and it did nothing for obesity. So this knowledge of calories, this knowledge of energy, I think it's completely useless. In fact, if you could have gone back and instead of saying how many calories does something have, it's just simply replace it with, is this food going to give you quick fullness and lasting fullness, right? That simple question is like, would it, you know, just would do more good than, you know, um, you know, how many calories does that have? So I think that these people are harmful. I actually think that these people are, are harmful for the majority of obesity management. And, you know, I think they've failed. I mean, look at the, I mean, 50% are, are nearly 50% are obese, right? I wouldn't be surprised if we see that after this COVID, you know, nonsense, right? So um, 50, you know, all the, you know, free Happy Meals and free Sam Adams and free donuts, it's just free smash burger. It's, 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 it makes me want to like, it's just frustrating. So the bottom line is, is the thermodynamic blowhards, they're probably harmful for most people. Now I'll tell you who they're probably beneficial for. The about, I don't know, 10 to 20% who have no hunger or appetite issues, right? If you have no kind, if there's, if uh, you can have a slice of pizza and be full, like, I don't know how my wife does it. She has one slice of pizza and she's full. If I eat a slice of pizza, Two hours later, the cold pizza actually tastes better. How many people here have noticed that? If you have a slice of pizza, or it's, you know, like two or three hours later, the cold pizza tastes better. So wouldn't it be great if somebody explained to people how the hell this happens, right? Why is it that cold Chinese food three hours later, right, tastes better than the Chinese food when you ate it three hours earlier? All you guys that raised your hands, right? If you went to a pizzeria and they gave you cold Chinese food, what would you guys do? Would any of you eat it? Raise your hand if you would eat it or, or yeah, actually raise your hand if you'd complain and be like, what the hell is this? Why am I getting cold pizza? If you went to a Chinese food restaurant and they gave you cold Chinese food, raise your hand if you'd complain, right? So, so this, is the, this is the thing. Nobody has explained why that pizza or that Chinese food makes people hungry three hours later. And if you go to the literature, it's there. If you read enough, you can figure it out. It's all postprandial hypoglycemia. Your blood sugar goes up, body releases a ton of insulin and your blood sugar comes plummeting down, right? It's like an oral glucose tolerance test, uh, Sean, right? So when it's basically that. And when, when you give somebody a ton of insulin, and you know this, Sean, you give somebody a ton of insulin and cause hypoglycemia, what do they say? I feel yeah, lightheaded. I feel dizzy. Yeah, they're then starving. They yeah, they want to eat something. Yeah, sure. I yeah. want to eat something. Get me. And did they ever ask for like a ribeye steak when when their blood sugar was plummeting? Yeah, you know, or did they ever ask for plain yeah, yeah. tuna or raw yeah. vegan broccoli? Did they ever ask for those things? No, right? They say, "Get me juice. Get me soda. Get me, you know, ice cream. Get me cookies. Get me cake." So the thing is, is that these idiots in in nutrition, they. Had, talk about calories, but they don't talk about the effects of those calories, right? They've literally done studies where they give people fat, like a fat lemon shake compared to a carb lemon shake. If you have a carb lemon shake, calorie for calorie, you will reach for food one and a half hours earlier, right? Then a fat shake, right? So, so, and the, just, let's take this example who, you know, Put up how many slices of pizza is like a normal, quote unquote, normal amount. Just put, show me in fingers how many you'd eat. Somebody put five there, three, four. Okay. Four, <laughs> let's just say you said two was normal. Two slices of pizza is 800 calories. If it's a New York style slice, right? 800 calories. That's 10 eggs, right? Would anybody here eat cold eggs two hours later and think it tastes better after eating 10 eggs? Would that happen to anybody here? No, right? So this is the problem with thermodynamics is that they're just missing it, right? They're taking the appetite and the effects of the calories out of the equation. And they're, so they're just wrong. 
They're just wrong. And they're only right for people who are doing so much exertion that it doesn't matter. Like they're at, like cannot even eat as much as they can't, they, they, they can't even eat enough to gain weight, right? Like athletes, or they're dealing with people who have low appetite. It might as well be anorexic, right? So, you know, it's those people that they're dealing with. And, and for those 10 to 20%, you know, those are your people, go listen to them, right? But for the 70% that are pre-diabetic or diabetic or pre-hypertensive, hypertensive, the 88% that have a component of metabolic syndrome, I mean, do not listen to these people. They're, 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 they're bad for you. Yeah, try just, you know, the point out about the calories, you know, I, mean, I remember when McDonald's put calories on their, on their menu, you know, as you could see that it doesn't make a difference. I mean, calories have been on menus or on nutrition labels since, I don't know, since I was a little kid, I think. And that information has not done anything. I mean, I know, you know, it's like uh, the one thing you mentioned, and I don't know if this exists, but it is, do you know, is, is there a listed satiety index for food? I mean, we have glycemic index and glycemic loads and calorie counts. Yeah, yeah. Don't get I me mean, started. I, don't, you're uh, really triggering me now, Sean, <laughs> because the satiety index for, to, for food is, is idiotic. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Okay. So they took potatoes and they said, first of all, the, uh, you know, according to the satiety index of food, okay, potato is the most satiating food, right? Okay. That sounds great, right? Like how many raw, you know, potatoes can you guys eat? You know, like zero, right? But um, so, so it doesn't account for volume, palatability, right? And it doesn't count for a lot of things. But uh, I mean, just let's put it this way. If you have baked potato, how many can you eat? How many baked potatoes can you eat? Just put your finger out. One, two, one, right? Just plain baked potato, you know? You know, if, you, if I forced you to, maybe one, right? Okay, how much olive oil would you guys guzzle down? Would anybody like take a cup of olive oil and just drink it here? How many? Just give me like a zero if you're a zero. So we just disproved the satiety index because people would eat a lot less olive oil, right? They'd be full quickly, more quickly, according to the satiety index versus a potato. So the problem is the satiety index, okay, it, it, it mixes up satiety with, you know, uh, uh, taste and palatability and volume. And it, there's a lot of different stuff there. Not to say that they're not part of this equation, it's part of it, right? If you guys eat one ribeye steak and then I give you a gallon of water, you know, uh, will you be full? You'll probably be full, right? You'll both be bloated and you'll have lasting satiety from the fat and the protein you just ate. So yeah, volume has an effect, but the satiety index as it stands, it's just a flawed, you know, it's a really flawed thing. And it doesn't take into account how people eat food. Nobody sits there and chews on a raw baked, you know, raw potato, right? So they're actually combining foods in ways to make, to eat more, right? That's how pizza works, right? It's like, it's, it's fat and carbs, right? And then you eat more carbohydrate than you normally would have, right? I mean, nobody would sit there and scoop flour into their mouth, right? Nobody would do that, right? But if you take the flour, mix it with a little water and oil, and then you add some cheese and some sweet sauce, right? Now you have salty, you have sweet, and you have carbon fat, right? You'll eat so much of that that you'll get that postprandial, you know, response. But if I gave you, you know, flour to just put into your mouth, nobody would eat anything. I guess flour is a very satiating food, right? So this concept of the satiety index, I don't know if I'm, if this is like too advanced or whatever, Sean, but it's, it's a bogus thing, you know, it's really a bogus thing. There is a satiety index food, how useful it is or real it is. I don't, I don't think it's useful, you know? Um, so yeah, there is, I mean, meat's pretty satiating on there. Um, I think the least satiating food was like marmalade or ice cream, according to that satiety index. So there's some truth to it, but it's, it's a flawed system. Yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, no, no, one, no one's obviously going to eat straight up flour. I mean, you, you have to be kind of, kind of completely. Eating. Yeah, nobody's going to eat straight up, you know, the oil either. But, right. but, you know, everybody says the carbs are the most satiating thing because potatoes, right? 
well, I guess, you know, olive oil is the most, fat must be the most satiating things. Nobody would guzzle, you know, olive well, I mean, oil. I mean, by that, by that uh, metric, sand would be the most satiating food. I mean, <laughs> exactly. you, you yeah. know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's going to eat that. Hey, let yeah, me ask you about, you know, sand, you know, yeah, since you have, you know, this data and, you know, a lot of people are interested, a lot of people don't have access to CGMs or at least blood glucose monitors. Um, are you seeing any correlations? I mean, you, you know, you talked about the, the, the misinformation that's been told and, and a CGM will sort that out. One, the one question I have is that I see, like in my own personal experience, my blood glucose goes up high when I exercise intensely. And we're told that high blood glucose is a problem. And so therefore, per that, I shouldn't exercise intensely, which we both know is nonsense. But, you know, I, I, I just, I, I, I caution, you know, it's kind of like we have the same thing. We have this data on calories and we say, well, we've got the data there, and therefore um, that's going to make a difference. And we have CGM data that, you know, may make a difference, may not. What, but what's what's what do you got found consistently that's that's correlated well with positive outcomes in your your opinion, anyway? Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. Not all glycemia is the same, right? Not all glycemia is the same. So. Um, so, but, but let's take a step back. If you have no access to a CGM, okay, we will get you a CGM. Text our office, okay? If you're in a state that we're licensed in, we'll send you a CGM, okay? So we'll send you a CGM. We've got the cost down fairly low. I think about $75 a sensor. Just so you know, if you get a doctor write a script, you may be able to get two sensors, like two Libres for about 75 or 80 bucks. The reason for that is Abbott cut a deal with the pharmacy benefit managers that, that we have no access to. We're basically passing off our CGMs for cost plus shipping. So we make no, essentially no money on the CGMs. Um, it's probably not even worth the, the time. We just mainly do it for a service to, uh, to our patients. But if you need a CGM, text the office, we'll get you a CGM. Now, the, uh, the, the problem you mentioned is not all glycemia is the same, right? So basically, you know, if I do sprints, my blood sugar goes up, right? Should I not do sprints? I mean, I don't know if I'm fasted and, or I haven't eaten and I'm low carb and I do sprints, my blood sugar goes up. If you look at the total area under the curve, it generally goes down, right? Like if you have a severe diabetic, right? Now the question becomes is, so if you have somebody with diabetes, right? And, uh, they do sprints, they'll get a, a spike, but then the, the, they're like sponges for sugar for the next several hours, right? So the total glycemia generally improves. The people whose glycemia actually worsens are people who don't have diabetes, right? So, so if you don't have diabetes, and let's say you did twice a day sprints, now you have glycemic excursions that you wouldn't normally have. Now, is that healthy? I'm not sure, right? I think there's some evidence that probably, um, I mean, you can overtrain. We know, we, there was a great study just like maybe within the past month that showed that if you go to about 90 minutes of high intensity exercise uh, a week, that your oral glucose tolerance tests worsen and your mitochondrial respiration worsens. Um, I think it's probably, you know, user dependent. Um, and I think it's, it's, you have to look at the whole thing. So I wouldn't judge everything by a momentary spike in sugar. You know, I, in fact, for most of the people in my practice, 99.9%, .9%, I'd say that small bit of spiking is probably going to lead to, you know, improvements throughout the day and improvements over the next week. Like if they're building lean mass, right? You have a spike. So yeah, momentarily your sugar looks poor, but like you're now building lean mass and kind of setting the tone for the future. So I don't, I don't know that it's, I don't, I wouldn't call it bad. And I would definitely say not all glycemia is the same, you know, and not all glycemia is in your control. Meaning if you didn't sleep, your blood sugar is going to be higher in the mornings. You know, if you're, if I had a lawyer on with a CGM and during his oral arguments under high stress scenario, his sugar goes through the roof. He doesn't do anything. You know, it's just a stress response. So you don't control all the glycemia and, um, but we're talking about less than 10% is not under your control. 
right? 90% is dietary carbohydrates. And you, you know, it's a good point. Not all glycemia is the same. Um, I haven't seen athletes really go much above 140, 150, you know, even like under crazy circumstances. So I, I like, I don't, you know, it's not pathologic. I, I don't view that as pathologic. It's just, they're asking their body to do that. You know, is it good over the long term? I don't know, you know? Yeah, I think that's the question that, that you know, I, I don't know that we know. But I think we do know that lean mass over the long term is good. I mean, I think we know that. I mean, I think that's reasonably the safe, safe scenario. I think, you know, particularly if, if you look at sarcopenia or morbid obesity or sarcopenic obesity, which we are now seeing, you know, as, as, a, as a weird combination where people are, you know, they don't have any muscle, but they have plenty of body fat, which is, you know, probably the worst possible position to be in. Um, what has been, you know, like walk us through, uh, you know, the, the, the common things you have to tell people, you know, you meet them for an hour and a half. I mean, what do you, what do you typically, I mean, everyone has a little bit of their differences and obviously there's specific medical concerns, but is there a general sort of process that you want people to go through? I know when I talk to people, I talk about for step one, you know, let's deal with this food relationship issue. You know, you've got to, you've got to eat for reasons that are based on nutrition, not psychology, you know, stress or whatever, but how do you, how do you kind of tackle people? I mean, you know, it's, I know not everyone's the same, but do you have a general guideline that's going to get you through a, through a, an, inter, an encounter? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can even, you know, kind of show you, we, we have basically two paradigms, right? We have two paradigms for um, our, uh, you know, our kind of approach and, you know, this is, this is really tough because, like I just said, you know, uh, just one example of, you know, what doctors don't know about is why pizza tastes better three hours later, why, you know, uh, Chinese food tastes better three hours later. These are just one of the, you know, one of the different things that people need to be educated about so they know what, um, what the food actually does to their intake, right? So they need to develop an awareness. You know, bottom line is this, we try to tell people that maintaining a healthy lifestyle is constantly bombarded, right? And you have a series of defenses and you're constantly bombarded by attacks on maintaining your healthy lifestyle, one of which is emotional issues that you kind of alluded to or reasons for eating you kind of alluded to. And when you look at kind of how we start the process for people. We try to help them understand like your lifestyle is a series of Swiss cheeses and these Swiss cheeses are your defenses. And there's a constant barrage of attacks on your lifestyle, right? I mean, even after you eat like a pound and a half of ribeye, who here could like rip out, you know, heavy whipping cream or uh, whipped cream and berries? You know, who could eat like an hour after a pound and a half of ribeye some whip, you know, or dark chocolate or Lily's chocolate. Anybody, anybody here? I don't see you. Yeah. Right. So what is that? Right. What, do, what drives that? Why do I want pizza an hour and a half after eating pizza? The first step is knowing the enemy, right? Why do I eat every time I'm stressed out? Not really during the stress, but usually post-stress. Why am I eating when, you know, I put the kids to sleep and, you know, it's nine o'clock and I'm watching TV. Right. So cultivating awareness is like usually the first step. And this is like woeful. We've woefully underprepared people. Uh, doctors don't even know. And then once you know, and that's the problem, this takes like an hour, this takes an hour in itself. We're working on the videos now just to make it a little bit easier and reinforce what we do. But and then once you do that, it's preparing. You know, like what the hell are you going to do? You know, make a bunch of, you know, get Greek yogurt, get you know, hard boiled eggs, cook up steak, have cold cuts, whatever it is. Like, you know, if you need to replace the chocolate. So the other thing we do is we make them aware of their problem foods and problem locations and problem situations. If every time, you know, you visit your cousin, Sam, you drink beer and have French fries, well, maybe go full, right? If every time, you know, you're at work staring at muffins, well, maybe we should make work safe, right? So preparing for that, you know, that difficult time. And then, you know, some people need to, to really remember why the fuck are you here spending $3,000 on me? 
you know, why are you here? Like you're spending a hundred dollars a month on me or whatever, $500 a month, whatever, you know, you decide whatever relationship you want. Why are you wasting your money on me? There's a guy down the street, you know, what, what is driving you? And maybe it's your diabetes and maybe it's your hypertension, but why are you here? Did you just want to look good in a bikini? That's fine. But let's just know what is driving you so that we remember that in that moment when, when you have to make a split second choice, like, do I go to the hard boiled egg that I have in the fridge or do I eat this Hershey bar? Right. And then, you know, this is something that you've done really well with that community aspect, community and support. We're like a binge eating hotline. Like you just call us, we'll help you. And then I think the problem is, is most people just focus on this impulse control. They're like, you know what? I failed. Yeah. Impulse control matters. But most of the time, if you have these all figured out and, and developed, you really don't need much impulse control. Most people who quote unquote have willpower just control their environment. Right. So, and, and, but yeah, there's some people who need that. Like, what do I do in that last minute moment? Right. And then I think the other thing to kind of, you know, the really the thing that took me a long time to figure out was this, this part, right. Is like, what the fuck went wrong? Right. What went wrong? Like talk to us. I've done everything wrong you can imagine. I've gone from one fast food place to the other. I've, you know, binge eaten ice cream and hid, hid the wrappers in the, you know, in the garbage can. I've done it all, right? So, so what went wrong? Tell us. What, went, what almost went wrong? So we can make that easier the next time, right? I think this part, people get in that learned helplessness where they just like, oh, I messed up. I might as well, they, they, they withdraw. No, share with us. I want to know about it, right? So you need to develop that. How do I make this easier for me, right? How do, like, where did I win? Did I, did I, act, could I have done better, right? Or did I do my best? And that's the coaching side of it is really, you know, getting over the shame and blame and just let's figure this out. You know, nobody would do that with their bank account. Nobody would like, you know, or nobody would do that with their car, like, you know, everybody drives around with a replacement tire, right? I mean, as simple as that. Does everybody drive around here with beef jerky in their car or a bag of nuts in their car? Right, you should if you have a problem with food. This way, anywhere you are in the world, does everybody know that they can, you know, just, you know, they're a mile away from a McDonald's, you know, hamburger patties? So that's the thing here is like, okay, what is it that, that you failed with, right? Nobody would get a flat tire and then get out, stab all the other tires, break all the windows and say, you know what, I'm gonna start on Monday. But when it comes to food, right? There's like this emotional aspect, the shame and the guilt and the feelings where they're just like, you know what, I fuck it, I might as well just do X, Y, and Z. If somebody was taking money out of your bank account, nobody, nobody here would like go to their bank account, take more money out and say, you know what, I'll fix this on Monday right? They wouldn't go on a shopping spree, but when it comes to food, they have this behavior. And so, you know, a big part of this is like re-figuring that out, you know, it's like, hey, it's not like that. It's just, let, let's figure out what to do. So that they, you know, that's one component, the defenses that we kind of really go into. And then, you know, for us, our health stack is pretty, pretty standard, you know, like it's first, you know, reduce the carbs. Then once your hunger is suppressed, you know, don't worry about weight loss here. Then when the hunger is suppressed, express that non-hunger by skipping meals. If you're not happy with those results after two, three, four months, then consider stopping the added fats. Most of the, you know, most of the time it shouldn't be a problem for your, you know, people just eating grilling meats. But like, if you're taking grilled meats and then putting more butter on it and then blue cheese dressing, I mean, it's just like, okay, no hunter gatherer would like stop the hunt, churn the butter and put it on the food, right? Like they just wouldn't happen, right? So maybe, you know, so <laughs> that's the third thing we would focus on if, and a lot of people come to us basically putting mayonnaise on everything, eating these fat bombs and, you know, it, it so we, we, at some point we usually address this, you know, and then exercise, right? Do you, you know, would you, should you consider an extended fast? Most people don't have to do extended fasting. 
And then like you talked about, Sean, it's that, that um, mental health and stress reduction is so huge, right? Understanding how that leads to intake and how that leads to your relationship to food and then sleep hygiene. Don't try to like get four hours of sleep because you were fighting with Lane Norton on Twitter and expect that you're not going to be hungry the next day, right? So, you know, understanding that, that, that there's other components to maintaining a lifestyle other than just not eating carbs or eating only meat or whatever it is you decide to do. Um, so that's, that's like the gist of our, you know, uh, our education, but, but I mean, there's a, there's a lot more and you, you know, you see it. I know you see it. It's like the long, the, it's how long you can evaluate this. Like seven years in, I'm still learning about my own appetite. You know, I'm still learning what drives me to eat. So it's, I don't know that, you know, I think you can cure obesity, so to speak, but the drivers of obesity, you'll never cure, right? They're always going to be there. We're all going to, you know, look at that steak and want to eat it at some point, right? So you have to get comfortable with that and know what your diet can and can't do. Your diet can make that postprandial hunger go away. Your diet can give you ketones, which suppress your appetite. Your diet will never take the fact that when you're stressed out by yourself, sitting in front of TV and you have, you know, M&Ms right by you, it's never going to take the wanting of that away. It won't do that. Right. It may mitigate some of the symptoms, but it just, it won't ever, it won't take that away. So knowing what your diet can and can't do. So, you know, what's up to you and what's up to the food you eat. Is that, is that what you're, is that too much? No, that's great. Troy. I like that. I like the, uh, the presentation there. You know, it's one of those things where I talk about, you know, for most, most pretty, I, I would say for all of us, you're going to deal with cravings and those types of things and having, a you know a backup plan in place i mean a lot of people have no plan it's like well, what are you going to do when you get hungry and it's eight o'clock at night are you just going to go and eat the you know the candy bar or are you going to eat something else you're going to do some exercise you're going to go for a walk you're going to call somebody you, know, you, you have to have something in place in that situation you know or you know it could be just you know like a satiety drink a bunch of water i mean there's there's a you've probably seen there's studies you drink you know a liter and a half water shuts down your appetite for 45 minutes that may be all you need you know i tell people because as you know these hunger cues often come you know, if it's ghrelin related it might be uh, you know cyclic and you've got this little wave you've got to ride out and once you can do that you're uh, you know you can get to the bed if you can get to the bed and and you know you wake up the next morning guess what you're not hungry for whatever reason you know it's kind of you know you're in ketosis or whatever and uh, now you're not hungry um i'm getting a lot of questions Joe. i, mean, just... I, I want to can i answer one of these i want to talk to art sure. Sure. Okay. Art okay, asked this question right here. Am I the only one who craves it? I'm going to have to step out in, in five minutes. I don't know how long sure. you go. Yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. Yeah. That's what I planned for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Art, so I'm going to talk to you. Okay. So uh, for the longest time, I thought to myself, I must be flawed that I can eat like, I don't know, six slices of pizza and then eat two more slices of pizza an hour later until you go to the literature, right? Until you go to the literature and it's very clear why you can have something sweet after two pounds of steak. Okay, that's in the literature and that's something no diet will ever get, a, get, get rid of. So you need to understand this. Okay, and the problem is this, okay? You eat two pounds of steak, you're full. Now, if an hour later we were to give you more steak and I said, you have to eat more steak, right? I hold the gun to your head, maybe you have a couple hundred calories. Okay, I said the C word. Okay, and uh, let's say an hour after that, I give you more of that same steak. And I'm like, you have to eat more. Okay, maybe you eat like 50 calories. You're like, I don't, I'm just, you're not interested, right? When we do this to any animal, they act the same exact way as humans. Okay, each subsequent thing after a full meal, after a big meal, they're, if it's the same food, they have less intake, right? They have less intake if it's the same exact food, okay? But let's say we take two pounds of steak and we change that food up. And I made this, I alluded it to you, you know, why is it if it's nuts and dark chocolate, now you can eat 500 calories. And then an hour later, if it's berries and whipped cream, this is all low carb, by the way, right? So berries and whipped cream, you can eat, again, another 500 calories. And that's across every species. That's not just humans. Right? So it's not some flaw of yours that you can have two pounds of meat. Actually, you just make a great wild animal. That's basically what it comes down to. 
the fact that you could eat two pounds of meat and then turn around and eat something sweet. If you were a wild bear and you finished eating salmon and you saw a bunch of honey and you saw a bunch of berries, and then right next to it, after you finished the berries and the honey, you saw some salty oysters, would you want to be hungry? Yes, you'd want to be hungry, right? All of those represent nutrients, different nutrients, those different sensations and tastes represent different flavors and different nutrients that's going to come to your body, right? Whether it's salt or whether it's carbs or whether it's other things that are come with the food, doesn't matter what it is. You want to be, you want that differing sensation to drive you to eat. Now it's a problem only for people with refrigerators and sofas and TVs, you know, and a, and a plethora of, of crap to eat and variety packs of food, right? That's who it's a problem for. But the, the signaling, the brain signaling, is, that's not, there's nothing wrong with you, Art, right? It's normal across multiple species. They act the same way. That signal is called sensory-specific satiety, okay? If your job is to get more full quickly, stick to the same food. If your job is to, or, you know, use another defense, right? How many people want to eat that an hour later, and if they just, like, drink some water, they don't really care. Or if they, you know, as Sean mentioned, if they get out of the house, nobody's going to get out of the house. Like, let's say you go on a hike and say, stop everything. I got to go back and have the chocolate, right? Nobody's going to do that. So time is a defense against that signal. Bloating is a defense against that signal, right? Okay. Uh, or volume, so to speak, is a defense, right? Or just being aware of it. This is a signal that no diet will ever get rid of. And I better figure out what I'm going to do, right? Because it's not going away. Sorry, Art, to lay on you here, but I hope that helps you, man. I, 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 t- I, I say it with complete endearingness because I, I have the same thing. And I was like, you know, there must be something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with you. Where's Art? Somebody, ra- Art, can you raise your hand? Is Art somewhere around? Is he hiding? Is he hiding? Well, there, there's three pages of there's three pages of screen, so you might have to scroll through screens. Yeah. So it's, it's Art, I hope that helps you. I don't know where Art is. I, I'm sure it, it would help to other people throw it. <laughs> and, you know, I know you got to go. I mean, yeah. Just a, yeah. just a quick question. You know, yeah. to find you because people are asking what state you're licensed in. Do you take care of carnivores? I know you have people in your practice that do a carnivore diet. So. Yeah. Um, where can people go to find out? And if they want to be one of your patients, how do they, how do they hook up with you? Yeah. Um, so we're redoing this, but you can go to my website, drtro.com and just uh, you could literally on the website, like send a message to the office and one of my staff will get in touch with you. Um, the States are always growing. So I don't even remember anymore, but it's basically New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Florida, North Carolina, um, Texas. Uh, I, I mean, I don't even know anymore. They're just always growing. I'm just trying to think of the big ones. Uh, we've, we're like mo- a little couple months away from California. Maine we have. Um, just trying to think what else. We have a couple of other states. Oklahoma. Um, we'll be nationwide at the end of the year, though. Art, I see you now. Art, was it helpful? Oh, uh, a bit. Um, I, 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 I feel like sometimes you know, I'm the only one. Uh, no, no, I'll you're fast not the only all day one. How fast? All day long. I've been doing it for about a year. Um, I work out during the day. I work all day on my feet. I get home. I fix uh, two to three pounds of, you know, good stuff, organ meat, steak, mostly from a ruminant animal. Uh, with I can tell you uh, within seconds after I'm done, and you know I'll go, you know without cheating I'll go two weeks, three weeks. Every night I've got a picture of a chocolate cake in my head and I can't shake it. If it was in the house I would eat it without question. I don't know if it's um, just a thing for me. I'm that addicted sounds to complete, sugar. Let's put it this way. It sounds completely normal. <laughs> sounds completely it does? normal. And I've met thousands of people who say the same exact thing. In fact, we had somebody on the Low Carb MD podcast literally last week lost 300 pounds saying that he can eat eight pounds of meat in a sitting. I kid you not. So you're at, you got a while to catch up to him. Yeah. And, like, and Dr. Sean. 
just eating berries erases that feeling of satiety. It's the sweet taste mm. erases that satiety. So there's a lot to learn and everybody's a little bit different, but what you're saying is not unique. I, we just hear it all the time, all the time. Okay. All right. Now the question is, what do you do about that? I don't think you're ever going yeah. to that signal, stick to the same food, you know, or buy yourself time and space. You know that if you fast all day, you're not like thinking about that chocolate cake, right? Right. So, I don't. I don't decide. I don't cra- have a single craving before I eat. That's Nothing. what I'm saying. It's, so I even know. hate the idea of eating it. Yeah. yeah. So my my time, space, volume, you know, time, space, volume, distraction, all those things would work. Right. If you get out of the house right after dinner, you're not going to care about that chocolate cake. Yeah, the days of the hardest time is, you know, I have seven grandchildren, so we celebrate birthdays in my family. So that's the hardest time I have. So sometimes I just won't eat until I get home. You're talking to a chocolate cake binger, man. So, you you know, don't, don't, don't make me promote my Uh, wife. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. I know you got to go. Appreciate it. Uh, just try, you know, uh, you know, hopefully we'll do this again down the road. Uh, good luck to you. Continue to uh, continue to appreciate your work on social media. As you know, we've got a long battle that we need more people to fight. And, you know, you're one of the good ones in that. So appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just before I go, any update on the, uh, the study, you know, I hope you do it with severe diabetics because I, we, we have a study. We just, where it was accepted for uh, severe A1C of 12 on average, right? Gone down to six, right? Gone down to six, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking it's a shoe in for a carnivore study. Yeah, no, that, that that's one, you know, one. That's definitely one aspect that you could do. You know, the problem, the problem is, you know, you've got a lot of medical uh, medication confounders when you have diabetics, so that's sick because they're usually on, you know, Excellent. yeah, medication. So you have to deal with with those con- confounders, unfortunately. But uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, we're we're definitely working. We're we're looking to get a real large study done. We've got several hundred thousand dollars raised. We're still raising, so we're going to get to you know probably close to a million dollars in in fundraising, and and then we'll do a, a a very large large study. So that is the plan. So that'll be awesome, man. Person, that'll perfect. be awesome. Keep me in the loop. Hopefully, I can help out. Will do, Trill. Okay, guys, you guys have a great morning. I gotta, uh, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.